Well, hi, everybody. Hi. It's good to be back with you one more time. So uh, this weekend, I think, is supposed to be about prayer, right? All right. And uh, somebody made a comment just now that I like to, I like to wax eloquent. You can quite say it that way. So um, here's, the, here's the message. Pray a lot. The end. Okay. <laughs> Um, tonight, uh, I want to talk about something that maybe you haven't given a lot of thought to when it comes to the topic of prayer, and that is asking boldly, asking boldly. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, if, you, if you're listening to this, you'll note that there is this word confidence, and we're going to come back to this word a couple of times, but the, you know, the scripture is talking about all that Jesus has accomplished, it's talking about the rest of a believer, and in light of all of that, we are admonished to draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Um, the writer of the Hebrews goes on, though, he says in Hebrews uh, 10, 19, and then again in verse 22, I'm kind of taking the two and tying them together. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest place by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. But we see again this word boldness or confidence. These two words, by the way, are the same word in Greek. It just depends on um, you know which translation you're reading and how they've rendered it so as not to repeat themselves re repetitiously over and over again. Nobody got the joke. Okay. <laughs> Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus. And then um, Paul has this theme in his letters. In Ephesians 3.12, he says, In Jesus we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. I think we're going to have to change the mic out. This isn't working. Or maybe it's rubbing on my face. Is that what it is? I'm the problem. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Come out. <laughs> All right. Let's try that. Is that better? That's better. Okay. All right. And then uh, Paul also says in 2 Corinthians 3, 4. So that's easy to remember, right? 2, 3, 4. 2 Corinthians 3, 4. Paul says, such confidence we have through Christ toward God. So there's something that's very thematically similar running through these verses that I've just read to you. They all have to do with boldness. They all have to do with confidence. Well, this is really the underpinning of prayer, of a life of, of dynamic prayer. And so when we talk about prayer, which is obviously our subject not only tonight but this weekend, I, I want to just pose the question, do we take prayer seriously enough? Do we take prayer seriously enough? And I ask that because if we did take it seriously, we probably would do more of it than we do. And, you know, this is a, this is a somewhat unique community, but I know in many respects the challenges of the Christian life would be the same here in Servants of Jesus as they would be in many other locations in the body of Christ. But I can tell you from talking with a lot of people that Oftentimes, prayer is something of an afterthought. Oftentimes, it's something you do you know, in the shower when you're either getting ready for bed or you're up in the morning. You pray maybe while you're brushing your teeth, and of course, you pray while you're on your way to work. But the idea of focused prayer, intentional prayer, uh, dedicated prayer, that becomes harder because everybody's busy, and you know we have many demands on us, and so... A lot of times people don't realize all that they are missing by failing to pray. And people tend to do what they enjoy and people tend to do what works. And, you know, I started this thing called Kingdom Fire Ministries about a decade ago. And I've seen prayer in action in countless ways and at countless times. Now, of course, there is prayer for healing. And when prayer for healing gets answered, it's fairly obvious because healing has occurred. 
And then there's prayer that may revolve around prophetic ministry. And when that one's working, it's fairly obvious because either you read somebody's mail, as we say, uh, or you give a word that you know comes to pass and you couldn't have known that without having been somehow engaged in the process of prayer. But when I say prayer tonight in this session right now, I'm not really talking about healing prayer and I'm also not really talking about prophetic words. It's not that they don't matter, I just mentioned them. But, but I want to focus in tonight, I want to talk specifically about intercessory prayer because when we come to intercession, I think one of our big challenges is that oftentimes um, you know, we pray and maybe something happens, but it's difficult to trace the link directly between I prayed and there was an answer. Now occasionally, it'll be the case that prayer is offered and almost instantaneously the prayer gets answered and you sit there and you go, wow, that really worked. But that's not usually the way it works. In fact, um, I've got a friend here from Newcastle and last weekend I was up there and I was talking about the fact that there are times you pray over here, you know, generally timelines run as you view it from here over to here. And so, you know, you pray over here and what you'd like to see is that linearly it just connects and ends, but that's not usually what happens. You pray and it's like you launch something into the air and it Sometimes it even seems to go backward. And then, it finally lands. And as you're standing here looking back at it, you go, of course, what could have been more logical? But that isn't obvious over here, and it's not even obvious when you're in the middle of the process. So it's difficult to trace direct, linkage, direct linkages many times when we're engaging in intercession. But sometimes there are just too many coincidences for everything to be coincidental. And so you realize that there is, in fact, linkage. And so, you know, some years ago I was talking to a man. He happened to have been my boss at the time. And uh, he stated that prayer was nothing more than speaking into the air and he didn't believe in God, so he continued on with that thought, and he said, since there is no God, not only is prayer speaking into the air, but it is a pointless exercise. Well, as the old saying goes, if I don't agree with your premises, I probably will not agree with your conclusions. And so, although he was my boss, and we had a good relationship, but you know, I still tried to be deferential to him. He was my boss when I had a real job in the outside world. Um, I, I didn't agree with his premise and I didn't agree with his conclusion because prayer is more than speaking words into the air. Prayer is powerful. And as a, a preacher that I like said, it, said not long ago, prayer is power. Well, as my boss said, he didn't believe there was a God. There is a God. I mean, we, we wouldn't be sitting here if we didn't believe that. But on some level, sometimes our faith gets challenged and sometimes we have a harder time believing that God is real. Other times we have an easier time believing God is real. But there is a God. Prayer is more than speaking into the air. Prayer is actually coming to the throne of God. Prayer is petitioning a king, a mighty king, a powerful king, a king who has the ability to act and who will act. A prayer then is calling for a kingdom to advance and prayer, if we're talking about it in the right sense, prayer is also being heard when we ask. And I think a lot of us struggle with that concept. We'll talk about it more uh, tomorrow. But, but prayer is being heard when we ask. All of this is prayer. So let me say it again. Prayer is coming to the throne of God. When we come, we are petitioning a king it is calling for a kingdom to advance, namely that king's kingdom, and it is being heard when we ask. That closes the loop on what we really should be seeing happen when we pray. So a couple years back, I went on a ministry trip to Sri Lanka, and when I went on that trip, the first night of my meetings, 
they were good meetings, I guess, by most standards, but I wasn't satisfied. I knew that somehow we were missing the mark. We were coming short of what God not only could do, but what he really wanted to do. And so with that sense of lack of fulfillment, I went home that evening and I uh, sent out an email to my intercessory prayer team. And uh, that team's grown over time. But by the way, if anyone here really likes to pray and intercede and somehow likes what I'm doing and you want to join, I can always use more intercessors. You'll hear from me a lot. But anyway, that's a side note. So I have this intercessory group, and I, I sent out this email. I was in Sri Lanka, and those people are mostly in Australia and the United States. There's a few in Europe and South America and so forth, but generally those two continents. And so I, um, you know, I sent this email out, and then I went to bed. And, of course, when I sent it, it was... 12 hours out of phase to the United States. So my night was their day. So they all started getting these emails while I was asleep and started praying. And Australia is a little bit ahead of Sri Lanka, but you know Australia woke up and my intercessors here, they saw what was going on. And so they started to pray before I ever walked into the next night of meetings. Well, in response to that intercessory blast that I had sent out, the next night we had... Um, healing and miracles that really, they broke out in the room. I don't think there's any other way to say it. There was one woman who was healed of spondylosis, and she was also healed of lifelong migraines. There were a number of people who were delivered quite openly and obviously of demons. Now, we don't always like to talk about this in the West, and um, in a lot of our you know modern church settings, we like to shut down demonic manifestation, but you know, one thing about demonic manifestation, when the demons are vanquished, the faith skyrockets. So maybe we should let them run and so that people can see Jesus winning. But that's just a thought. Anyway, so this was going on. A number of people got delivered of demons. Another woman got healed of allergies to cheese, chocolate, papayas, and tomatoes. Four major allergies. Cheese, chocolate, papayas, and tomatoes. Now, can you imagine living in a tropical country in which you cannot eat papayas? I mean, you would starve to death. And, you know, maybe even tomatoes. I mean, tomatoes, we have them here, you know, even in non-tropical areas. But they, you know, she couldn't eat tomatoes. But, you know, I could imagine maybe getting by without without uh, papayas. I could imagine maybe without tomatoes, although I really do like both. But now when we're talking about cheese and chocolate, now this is a no-fly zone. I mean, these are staples of the marriage supper of the lamb. So, you know, if you have allergies to these things, you might as well just give up now and just cash in your salvation status because you're not going to be happy in heaven, right? Anyway, I'm obviously joking. <clears throat> but... Anyway, the next night, a man who was paralyzed because he had a broken back came right up out of his wheelchair and pushed his wheelchair out the door as he left. And several other people who had different kinds of mobility impairments, whatever they may be, I actually don't remember them all now, but anyway, um, all of those people were healed. And then later that week, there was a man with Parkinson's disease, and he was healed. And then there was a woman with asthma, and she got healed. And another woman, she had a weird kind of an autoimmune disease. I remember her coming up to me and taking my hand uh, and, you know, and making me touch her stomach. And I generally don't do that to women. I'll put their hand and then mine on top of theirs. But I don't touch women's stomachs. But she wanted me to touch her stomach, and it was hard like the top of this lectern or this podium this pulpit there was just no give in her body at all it was hard like a rock and I said to her what is that and she said well I have an autoimmune disease and I know I'm going to die of it it, it makes my organs hard and it's putting fibrous tissue throughout my whole body wall and so this is this is how I am going to die and I said I think there's a better solution to that so anyway I prayed for her and um, she had been educated in the practice of medicine at, I can't remember if it was Oxford or Cambridge, but a good British university. And she was practicing there in Sri Lanka. This effectively made her the best doctor around in her specialty. In fact, it made her the best doctor in the country in her specialty. And the next morning she woke up and her body was soft. 
And so she went down to her own laboratory, drew her own blood, and ran the assays on it and did a quick clinical check. And she came to the meeting that morning and said, I've been healed. And she takes my hand again and, you know, lets me touch her now soft stomach. But she said, more than that, I've got chemical, you know, proof that this is the case. That woman was the sister of the pastor who had, you know, was holding these meetings. So this definitely got his attention as well. Anyway, there was also a severely autistic woman who was dramatically improved after she received prayer. And there was another woman who had a growth on her throat that was 12 centimeters by 8 centimeters in size. Now that's a big growth. And you know, it's just right there on her throat. And so we prayed for it and it just evaporated. It just vanished in front of our eyes. I don't know where it went, but it was gone. And so you know, she'd had this thing for more than eight years and had all kinds of medical treatment, none of it had worked. But in some meetings, literally every single person we touched was healed. And so it was, a, it was an incredible breakout experience in Sri Lanka. I could go on with more stories, but you get the idea. And what was the one thing that shifted all of it? Prayer. I'd sent that email and my intercessory team took it to heart and so whether they got on their knees or climbed into their treehouse, I don't know, but they prayed. And in response to that prayer, something broke loose. And so back to what my former boss said, prayer is more than speaking into the air. Prayer changes things. It certainly did in Sri Lanka. Well, I'm going to end this series on uh, Sunday with talking about how prayer changes things. So I won't, I won't give you some of the more dramatic examples I could give, but We'll, we'll just leave that there dangling as kind of the teaser that you should come back Sunday morning. Anyway, prayer has the ability to activate the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is, well, it's the center of everything Jesus preached. I mean, he preached a lot of things, but Jesus was not some moralizing prophet. I mean, he expected morality, don't get me wrong, but it, you know, this was not just about be good and try hard and be nice. This was about expecting the dynamic activity of God's kingdom, the inbreaking, the, the catalytic nature of it to be activated. And in fact, Jesus said on one occasion, Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is within you. So there's something about prayer that, that activates the kingdom of God that is inside of us, but which may not really be finding its highest expression yet. And in the interesting thing is in that, in that passage, Luke 17, 21, when Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you, do you know to whom he was speaking? He was talking to Pharisees. He was telling them about what was possible even with them, unbelieving, heart of heart, opposing him as they did, he said this to them, and they questioned the very premise of the kingdom having come, the very message that Jesus proclaimed. I, I think there's something of that, that that we all struggle with on some level. If, if you want to say it that way, there's a bit of a Pharisee in all of us. And I'm not saying it to throw brickbats or anything. I'm just saying this is the way it rolls. This is human nature. But Jesus said the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven was within them, and yet they were not living kingdom life. And I think sometimes we don't live kingdom life because our own prayer lives are shallow, and honestly, we don't make time for them as we might. And sometimes there's more valid reasons, and sometimes there's a lot less valid reasons. But at the end of the day, we all face the same problem. We have 24 hours in a day, not one minute more and not one minute less. And within that 24-hour frame... We have to allocate our time in such a way that we do something productive with it. So how much should we pray? I don't know. We pray enough to get breakthrough. And you know, for some people, maybe it comes faster or seems to come faster. For others, maybe it takes longer. But let's just say this. These Pharisees, they were not living kingdom life. And there are many who come short of kingdom living even today. There are many who attend church, maybe who are religiously observant, but for whom the abundance of the kingdom of God seems remote or distant or maybe even unachievable, and this is not the way God intended it to be. The Lord intended that we would experience the abundance of kingdom life, 
and part of the gateway to that is this thing called prayer. And how do we know this if the kingdom is within us? Well, perhaps the kingdom is within us, but it lies dormant until we call it forth. Prayer moves the heart of God. It indeed does that. It will also move the hand of God, but it also activates us. It shifts something inside of us. And there, there is a place in prayer. We don't talk about it much anymore. All the books that I have that even approach this topic and deal with it at all either were written in the 1920s, 100 years ago, or they're written about people who lived in the 1920s, 100 years ago. Um, but there is this thing called prevailing prayer, where in prayer, you secure the wind before you ever do anything else. And when you get up from wherever you're praying, you might be on your knees, you could be sitting in a chair. As I said, you might be up in your tree house if you have a prayer tree house. But wherever you're praying, you secure the wind and you know when you've, when you've gotten up that the battle has already been won. I meet virtually no Christians today who even use that kind of language. And yet it is something that exists in the realm of God. And there is a way to find our way to that. And prayer will activate that within us such that when we are praying with this confidence, when we are praying with this boldness about which the Hebrew writer wrote, about which St. Paul wrote, when we do that, something inside of us comes alive. And so I'll say it again, maybe the kingdom is within us, but it lies dormant until it is called forth through prayer. And so maybe if we understand that, you might remember the story where Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration and the disciples, nine of them, have been left at the bottom of the mountain and they're, they're running the healing crusade, right? Jesus is away with Peter and James and John, but these nine guys are having their day in the sun and uh-oh, they run into this boy that they can't get free. And so at the end of that exchange, Jesus has sorted it out as he does and they come to him and they say, Master, why could we not drive it out? And depending on which translation of the scripture you're reading, he either said to them, this kind only comes out through prayer or this kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. But the one thing that's common to either translation of that passage is prayer. And what he's really telling them is, men, your spiritual lives are shallow. You don't actually believe what, what I have taught you about praying. Yeah, I, I've shown you by my own life that I pray. I've taught you how to pray, and yet you still don't do it. And so when you fail at this thing that I've given you to do, and then you come and say, why did it fail? I really don't have anything left to tell you other than you need to pray. And so with that, I, I you know, it, I'm not trying to chide as much as I'm just trying to draw the story to its logical point. And I, I really believe that for all of our modern whiz-bang technology and our smartphones and our you know, cars that'll drive themselves, and if you've got the right model of car, it'll park itself, even parallel park itself you know, in the modern world. Even though we have aircraft that can, well, Monday morning, one's going to take me from Sydney all the way to Los Angeles without running out of fuel, going off course, you know, it's going to be comfortable inside the cabin, et cetera, et cetera. You know, for all of that technology, we, we forget that there are things that we cannot do but for the fact that we are in prayer. And so often our setbacks in the kingdom revolve around this lack of prayer. And so Jesus tells his disciples after their failure to heal that boy in Mark 9, he says this kind only comes out through prayer, because what they really needed in them was a greater level of kingdom activation. And so, you know, a lot of times people say, well, I want more of the kingdom. If you want more of the kingdom, worship will help, and Bible reading will help. All these things will help, but the one thing that we don't seem to do very well with is praying. So the Bible also, though, speaks of a heart, a true heart, in full assurance of faith. This is the language of Hebrews 10.22. A heart that is filled with the full assurance of faith. So this is a true heart that is filled with truth. 
That's what it's talking about. And so to be a person with that kind of a heart means we apprehend truth. I would say more than that, we, we lay hold of the truth and we don't let it go. And you know, when you, when you get a hold of that, it's like a dog with a bone. And so a heart that is a true heart that is filled with truth, and now I am trying to repeat myself, that kind of a heart is a heart that is missing dissimulation and equivocation. It's a heart that when it comes to God, it has, um, well, it's different from those that are filled with lies and falsehood and who are double-minded. The scripture says, an, an unstable man in all his ways, a double-minded man. That's, that's what is the opposite of where we want to go. So when we talk about um, a heart that does not equivocate, that is not filled with dissimulation, such a heart is found in a person who is confident both in who they are and in what God has done for them. If you're more comfortable with it, you could say in what God has done for them and therefore who they are. But the point is these two are interlinked. To have confidence in prayer means you are very sure of what God did for you and you are very sure, therefore, of who you are in him because when you come, you come as a son or as a daughter. And when a person like this asks, that person expects to receive because they know that they can ask expecting to receive. Said another way, there is an expectation that when they pray, they will get what they've asked. And I would say that for the average Christian that I've met, that is not the case. The average Christian comes to God and says, oh Lord, if it be thy will. The average Christian comes to God and prays and hopes for the best. But that's different from the kind of prevailing breakthrough prayer that I mentioned a couple minutes ago where you get, you get into the place of prayer and when you finish that praying, you rise knowing that you have secured the victory. Does that make sense? I was in Chile a week and a half ago, just before I came here to Australia. I flew home on Monday morning. I flew, took an overnight flight from Santiago on Sunday night, <clears throat> landed in, in Los Angeles. I guess I'm going to say it with a Spanish accent. I left Santiago and I landed in Los Angeles. <laughs> but anyway, I landed in, in Los Angeles on Monday morning, and on Wednesday night I got on a plane and came here and landed on Friday morning, last. So that was a week ago when I landed here. So <clears throat> I was in Chile and I, was, I got into a conversation while I was down there with a good friend of mine and he's been studying the Argentine revival closely. If you're a student of revival, you would at least know about the Argentine revival. It really hit its peak, um, I don't know, in the, like the 50s and 60s, but it, it lasted until the 1970s and it really changed the face of Argentina. And one of the things that was common in the Argentine revival was there was a handful of men, and they were all men, so I'm not, I'm not excluding women when I say that. I'm just acknowledging what was a historic data point. Well, anymore you have to say these things because people get offended. So there was a handful of men that were kind of the, you know, these breakthrough leaders of the Argentine revival. And so I was talking with this friend of mine, he'd been studying them, and there's one particular guy that he's quite taken with right now, and he said one of the things that really impressed him about that individual and his approach to, to revivalism is that he would send his intercessory team into the town where he was going to preach ahead of his own arrival, and they would begin to pray over the town. And, well, I guess they have a different work ethic in Latin America, but they might be there for a week or two before his, before his arrival. And then he himself would arrive and he would pray. And some of the stories that you hear out of all that praying might curl your hair. Uh, one of those revivalists, I met him a couple times when I was working with John Wimber. He would go into his hotel room, shut the door, fast and pray, for breakthrough over the town where he was going to be ministering. And oftentimes the devil himself would appear to him 
and would like pick the guy up and throw him across the room. And, you know, he would crash into the wall and fall to the ground. It was like a barroom brawl. But he would prevail in prayer against this demonic assault. And when he had secured the victory, he would emerge, often bruised, but he would emerge from his hotel room. And then they would go and they would preach and incredible breakouts would happen. But what was really interesting was that even as they would begin the crusades, the intercession team would remain on station and they would often go under the stage. You know, these, these crusades would be held in large open areas. And so you couldn't preach from a low platform like this just to be seen over the crowd. You know, the thing might be, you know, 10, I don't know, 10 meters high or something. And so they would, you know, climb up onto the platform. Well, underneath the intercession team would be praying, and they would they would begin to hold the crusade, and it would build, it would it would crescendo. And and I've seen something of this in my own meetings. It's often true that, you know, whatever wherever we are on night one, you know, night two is more powerful than that. And if we're doing meetings during the day, well, then the third and fourth meeting, it seems like the, the level of release and faith and anticipation rises session by session by session commonly. And so they were seeing something of this in the Argentine revival. And so what they found was that they would have people get saved and healed, delivered, miracles, whatever would go on over the course of several days. But there was something about hitting day 20. I don't know what it is about day 20. But on day 20, they would hit an inflection point, And then it was like, it would just take off. And then, like, all heaven would break loose. And tens of thousands would come into the arena. And tens of thousands would get saved. Well, it wasn't just the preaching as good as it was. It wasn't just the signs and wonders as good as they were. It was that they already had something in the neighborhood of five weeks of prayer invested into these breakout events in which great harvest was occurring. So anyway, my friend was talking to me and he said, you know, we believe that Chile is ripe for a visitation of God akin to what happened in Argentina. And he said, do you think you'd be willing to come back for a month? We want to try doing this. And we want to have you come and preach and do this. And I was like, yeah, I'm in. Game on. So next year, I'm going to go down to Chile for a month, and we'll see what happens. But you know, it doesn't have to be across an ocean. Why couldn't it happen in Sydney? Why couldn't it happen in Melbourne? Why couldn't it happen in Perth or Brisbane? Canberra, Darwin, right? Let's name them all. Adelaide, Alice Springs. Well, anyway. <laughs> so, I mean, but honestly, I'm, I'm raising a question here. You know, sometimes we hear about these great moves of God and we go, wow, awesome, God's moving in that country. I don't know why he doesn't move here. But, you know, the thing that they did was they actually took this to heart. And so, I, I just wonder, they knew that they could ask and expect to receive. And there's a few of you whose faces I recognize. You've come to my meetings on and off. I don't say it as much these days as I used to, not because I don't believe it. I just, you know, you, you can't say the same thing all the time. You've got to shift a little bit and change the mix. But expectation is the combustible fuel of faith. And where there is expectation, great things happen. It's like if you walk into a room filled with natural gas and you just strike a match, what's going to happen? <laughs> well, wouldn't it be great if we had that kind of expectation? In Argentina, they did. You know, I saw a video yesterday. I was checking my Instagram. I'm kind of weeks behind on that, but... Anyway, I happened to take 15 seconds to look at it. And there was some footage there of a, of a prophetic guy that I know about. I've not met him. I guess I probably will at some point. But there was a, 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 an event going on in Blantyre, Malawi. And there was this gigantic crowd of people. And he was walking in through the crowd. He had a security detail around him because everybody was trying to you know, mob him and touch him. But as he was walking through the crowd, people were just falling out under the power of God. What is it that's making that happen in Malawi? Expectation. This man carries something. 
this man is a prophet or an apostle or an evangelist or whatever they're going to call the guy, but this man is doing this thing and there's something with him and if we can just get near him and sure enough, when they would, it would happen. In the West, what do we do? Hmm. That's worship of men. They should know that they should grab a hold of Jesus. But you know, sometimes God puts his spirit on people and sometimes that becomes contagious. It goes viral within a community. And a whole community prays something of heaven down upon the earth. And, and that's really what I want to focus on, not so much the man. But, but I do recognize that dynamic. And so I'm back to this statement. Some people ask, they expect to receive because they know they can ask, expecting to receive. Do you know that you can ask? with the expectation that you will receive. That is a breakthrough concept. Now, prayer is mysterious, admittedly. And it's, it's, not, it's not always easy to understand how you get from point A to point B. That's my somewhat hyperbolic illustration of you started here and you go this huge circuitous route, you end up over here. Okay, but... The point of mysteries is they're meant to be unraveled. Understanding how prayer works, getting to the place where we connect and see breakthrough, this is supposed to be something that we live in. Jesus taught the disciples to pray with a specific intention that they would be able to do it with effectiveness. And it's in the Bible because the expectation is that we would learn to do it with effectiveness. So prayer is not meant to be something where we throw things out there hoping they'll stick to the wall what like, well, like so much spaghetti that your three-year-old or three-year-old grandson or granddaughter you know, threw against the wall when they were having a tantrum and didn't want to eat breakfast or lunch that day. Do you serve spaghetti for breakfast? I guess you do with three-year-olds. Anyway. <laughs> but prayer is not meant to be something where every now and then something works. And the rest of the time, we simply, you know, throw up our hands and say, well, you know, better luck next time. So that, reason, that raises a really important question. How do we move from the random nature of prayer to the kind of focused praying that, that opens the heavens and brings breakthrough into our midst? I think it's a really important question and one that's worth asking. So the other side of this equation is that we have to ask for kingdom purposes rather than our own. Now, I want to talk about that separately. It, it's worthy of its own consideration. But I'll, I'll simply say this. We don't just get to ask any old thing that happens to come to mind. We, we, and we, we don't just pray frivolous prayers. We pray prayers that are consistent with the nobility and majesty of God and that are worthy of the things that are on his heart. But I will say this just as a, as a preamble to that. 1 John 3.21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence before God. So if confidence is a big deal, and it, you should already know that it is because I highlighted it in several verses from Scripture, if confidence is one of these key aspects of prayer, and if the Scripture tells us that this is the confidence we have, but it, it happens only when our heart does not condemn us, then one of the first things we've got to do is get to where our hearts are not in a state of condemnation. And you know, this, this term for condemnation, it means to put down. It means you know, we're, we're somehow under the gun and, and we, we can't even look up. We, we are, we're being held back. So condemnation holds us back and it stops us from coming to the throne of God with confidence and with the expectation that we will receive. Now, a lot of times when you talk to people about their prayer lives, or for that matter, just their spiritual lives, you know, they'll tell you, well, I don't know. I just don't feel close to God. You know, I, I feel like God's mad at me. I, I, I'm, I'm not good enough. And, and so they're caught in all these things, maybe of the past, maybe, maybe with good reason, but the point is, God's intention is that our hearts get clear of that so that we don't live in that place. And there's all kinds of strategies for that. Some of them are confession of sin. Some of them are inner healing related. Maybe there's deliverance. I don't know. There's a number of ways we deal with these things. 
and that's all well and good, but I, I don't want to talk about all that right now. I just want to talk about if our hearts don't condemn us, then we have parousia, which is the word that means both confidence and boldness before God. So if your heart condemns you, good luck. You're not going to get anywhere. And a condemning heart is the one that's unstable in all its ways. Because you no sooner ask than you think, why would God give me that? I'm not worthy of that. <laughs> I'm thinking of that <laughs> Did anyone ever see Wayne's World? Am I allowed to admit that I saw that movie? You know, and they, meet, they run into Alice Cooper with the backstage passes, and as soon as they run into Alice Cooper, they, they go, we're not worthy, we're not worthy. I think a lot of Christians are that way. And it, it, it arises from this worm theology, right? Oh God, I am not worthy to come into thy great presence and thou magnificent beauty and benevolence, thou hast bestowed upon us. And you know, on it goes with these sonorous tones and this long-winded stuff. None of that is confidence. And yet so many Christians have been conditioned into that. Does, does this make sense to everybody? And, and then John goes on, so 1 John 3.21, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. John goes on, 1 John 5.14 and 15, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know this, that if he hears us, whatever we ask, we will have the petitions that we asked of him. I mean, that's pretty clear. But for most people, it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I, I don't know what that is, but that's not been my experience. Let's move on from here. Nothing to see, folks. So I don't want to talk about alignment tonight. I don't want to talk about that tonight. We will, but not tonight. But I do want to focus on this word again, parousia, boldness, confidence, assurance, praying with boldness. This is where it begins. And if we can't find our way to that boldness, where we aren't condemned, where we ask with that expectant state of heart, well, then it's no wonder our prayers aren't working. And this is why we receive grace in prayer. What is grace anyway? Grace is the empowerment of God to fulfill that which he has called us to do. I know people often render it as God's unmerited favor, but it's a lot more than unmerited favor. Unmerited favor sounds very passive. It's just sort of, you know, you receive it, but you can't really do much about it. But if, if, if grace really means something that is empowering, something that enables us, that's a far bigger concept. And so this is why we receive mercy uh, and we find grace to help us in time of need that God would undertake for us, that God would bear us up. So we become partners with God. He's obviously the senior partner, but we're partners. And this is why God, for example, walked with Adam and Eve in the garden each day. They were having, if you will, a staff meeting. Partners talk as fellow contributors. Each brings what the other does not bring or cannot bring. So when we talk about boldness, where do we see examples of bold praying in Scripture? Well, there's more than you might think. Let's talk about Abraham, Genesis chapter 18. The Lord appears to him and says, shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I am about to do? And so Abraham begins to bargain with the Lord of the universe over the very fate of the city of Sodom and of Gomorrah. And he negotiates with God. Have you ever negotiated anything with God? If not, why not? Because negotiation is actually a possibility. So he negotiates with the Lord and the, and the number needed to save the city drops progressively from 50 to 10. In the end, the city's still destroyed. Maybe Abraham should have asked for five. But anyway, he didn't. So when they got below 10, it was game over. But that's only because there weren't 10 righteous people in the city. But the point of the story from what we're talking about right now is not how bad was Sodom, it's that Abraham got what he asked for. And he got what he asked for because he was confident in his asking. He knew he could do it. Why? Because it had already been credited to him as righteousness. He had believed God before, he was still believing God then, and so when he stands before the Lord, he's like, hang on a minute, I want to talk about this. 
and the Lord listened to him. Yeah, wow. It's a wow concept. How about this one? Elijah. He prayed seven times for rain on the top of Mount Carmel. And when he did, he ended a 42-month drought, 1 Kings 18. Who needs a desal plant when you've got that? <laughs> now, Elijah is specifically used, specifically and explicitly used as an example of someone whom we should seek to imitate in our faith because he was a man just as we are men or women. It's what it says in the book of James, chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Elijah was a man just like we are. And he prayed earnestly, and it did not rain. And he prayed again, and then it did rain. What did Elijah have? He was confident. And when he prayed, he secured what he asked for. Later, his successor, Elisha, 42 youth come out and jeer him. Imagine that. Talk about, you know, gang and mob dynamics, right? They jeer him, and Elisha calls down a curse, and two bears come out of the woods and maul the 42 youth for harassing him in his dotage. <laughs> this story is in 2 Kings chapter 2. Verses 23 and 24. It's a disturbing story to our ears. Why would a prophet of God call out a bear? You know, far better to be stoned and dragged behind the wagon or something. But, um, but this is what he did. And the point of the prayer, again, is not to try and settle the morality or the rightness or wrongness of what Elisha did, but it's that Elisha obviously expected that his prayer would be answered, and it was. How about this one? The Syrophoenician woman. This is in Mark chapter 7. This woman came to Jesus, and it says she repeatedly asked for her daughter to be healed. And the interesting thing is, because she was a Syrophoenician, i.e., not Jewish, she had exactly zero basis upon which to approach Jesus. And this is why when Jesus is talking with her, he goes, you know, lady, I'd like to help you, but, you know, healing is for the children, and sorry to tell you, but, you know, you're not among that group. And then, you know, he talks about it's not right to feed the food, the children's bread, to the dogs. And what does she say? She could get pushed back by that. She goes, wait a minute, but even the dogs eat the crumbs. So give me a crumb. Call me a dog if you want. But my little girl needs healing, give me a crumb. And so when she does that, she gets what she asks for. How about this one? Peter, the apostle, was scheduled for execution. And the church gathered to pray, and Peter got released. Now apparently some of those praying weren't actually convinced that anything would come of this. So they were praying what? With double-mindedness. But there were apparently enough people present who were not double-minded that this thing worked, and so when Peter showed up at the door, some thought it wasn't Peter at all, but his angel. He must already be dead. <laughs> this is in Acts 12, uh, verse 15. And then how about this one? Paul sought repeatedly to return to the Thessalonian church that he had planted, but he said Satan continually hindered him from doing so, 1 Thessalonians 2.18. So rather than yielding to that and saying, you know, it's too hard of a hill to climb. Saul, Paul instead wrote to the church at Thessalonica, and among the things that he asked for, he said, I ask that you would pray collectively in order that I might actually be able to return to you once again. Paul believed in prayer. So there's, there's a lot of other places we could cite, but, you know, these half a dozen examples, I think this is enough to establish clearly this idea of prevailing prayer because of boldness. It, it was part of the, of the nature of the way men and women of faith lived in times gone by. Now, some of these examples I've given you, they involve individual prayer. Others of them are, are more collective. But they all share one thing in common, boldness. And so this Greek word for boldness, I've already said it a couple times, but the word is parousia, 
and it's usually translated boldness or confidence. I like to call it confident boldness or bold confidence. That way we capture both ideas. But you know, when you get around this, boldness and confidence, they are not brashness. They are not arrogance. Sometimes people want to use these terms and they do become brash and arrogant. This is why we need that counterbalance of being in the center of God's will, praying unto breakthrough and being able to pray in consistency with God's will. That's part of what keeps us from being brash. So parousia is expectation without impudent demands. That's the, that's the governor on this thing. Now, the other thing that, that goes with this, and we'll talk about this separately tomorrow also, is prayer is two-way communication. I, again, I won't belabor it. I want to save that for its own uh, conversation. But prayer of the type that is prevailing prayer that is rooted in boldness is two-way communication. And so with that, this isn't just you walk in with your prayer list and start firing things off. It is more like Adam and Eve under the trees with God. It's more about finding your way to the, the, the meeting of the minds, if you want to say it that way. So in closing, I want to just draw attention to a teaching that's circulating in the body of Christ right now, and it's gaining a lot of traction. It's actually been rolling around loose for about five years or so. And that teaching says that to get answers to prayer, we must somehow go into a heavenly courtroom. Maybe we ascend would be the way some phrase it. And when we ascend, we get some sort of decree or writ from the judge in heaven. And there's a lot of talk about heavenly courtrooms, not, not in the sense of the heavenly court where the courtiers are present and the king is on his throne. In that older sense of courtroom, there is something like that. But this is more like a judicial courtroom like you might find in downtown Sydney. And when we go there, we're supposed to obtain some sort of writ from the judge. And then having received the writ, we descend to the heavenly trading floor and we present the writ to the devil and we demand that he release whatever he has placed into the writ. It's all very complicated and there's no place that the Bible speaks of this. No place. But this is one of the most popular winds of doctrine that's going through the body of Christ right now. So the Bible doesn't speak of ascending into heaven in order to pray. I guess that could happen. Paul talks about being caught up to the third heaven. But we don't have to ascend. Most of the biblical examples of prayer that we find in the, in, in, that we're encouraged to, to emulate, several of which I've already given, in these examples we see that the person is still very much on earth if their spirit is ascending somehow, the Bible makes no mention of it, and there's absolutely no requirement of it mentioned. So you don't need some special technology in order to pray, some insider knowledge or you know, Gnostic capability. Obtaining writs from God or anyone else in order to have our prayers answered. Well, this is uh, the only such reference, and it doesn't even address this as the same subject matter, is to the written decrees that were written against us that are mentioned in Colossians. Paul talks about how they were canceled and nailed to the cross. So there's no need for writs. There's no need to go and you know, secure something from some heavenly judge. And then trading floors, the idea of you know, going down and brokering some deal with the devil. Number one, there is no mention of trading floors in heaven. Trading floors are an invention of modern capitalist economies. They exist inside of banks, stock exchanges, and commodity exchanges. That's what a trading floor is. Now, trading floors are necessary for the proper functioning of capitalist economies, but they have zero relevance for prayer. And then bargaining with or demanding anything from Satan. In fact, the scripture tells us that even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with Satan over the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a blasphemous or railing accusation, an impudent <laughs> accusation, but rather said, the Lord rebuke you. So basically all four of the key premises of this courts of heaven teaching, are you guys aware of courts of heaven? Have you heard of this here? You have some of you and the rest haven't. Consider yourself lucky if you haven't heard of it. But I'm telling you, it's a major thing out there right now. Anyway, none of the four of them hold up under biblical scrutiny. 
And so this kind of approach to prayer sounds very Gnostic in an updated 21st century kind of way. And of such things, Paul the Apostle said this, let no one disqualify you, insisting upon asceticism and worship of angels going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head. So I love, I love one of the other translations that says he goes on in detail about visions he has supposedly seen, meaning even Paul's going, I don't believe this. Whoever this guy is, whatever he's saying, I, I am not buying it. So how do we do this? We simply go before our Father in prayer based on the fact that he's already named us as daughters and sons. And with that identity firmly in mind, and again, if you're having trouble holding on to that, maybe you need some you know, inner healing prayer. Maybe you actually need to get born again for real. Or maybe you need to do some business around sin that you're still dwelling in that's hidden, that gives you a lack of confidence before him. There are strategies for addressing that, but that's not my point tonight. I don't want to, I don't want to delve into it too deeply. I do want to mention it because I know there will be some in the crowd that will be going, I just can't be confident before God. I don't know, I don't know how to get there. So, okay, duly noted. But once we get that sorted out, what you do is you go before the Lord confident that you approach him in the name of Jesus. This is why when Jesus taught us to pray, he said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father, let your kingdom come. And he, he does say who is in heaven and all that. I know that. But, but the, the, the gist, the kernel of that prayer is our Father, Start with the Father, grounded in him. I taught on this once when I came here. I taught on how the Lord's Prayer is a kingdom prayer. So start with that one. Go to your Father in prayer, confident that you approach him in the name of Jesus, robed in his identity, robed in his authority, covered in his righteousness, and know this, that the way is open. When you go to him, you can find him and when you find him, approach him in confident boldness, in parousia, asking God-sized prayers in order that he may do far more than you ever thought was possible because there is a power at work within you that will bring that thing about. And that is where we'll close the message tonight. You know, there's a lot of ways to open a conference on prayer. Some people want to talk about meditation or contemplation or whatever, but I want to start with this idea of confidence because the kind of praying that we see in the Bible that is commended most often is that kind of confident praying that brings about breakthrough. And if you will do this with confidence, then you will begin to see the heavens shift things on your behalf. You may well secure the victory before you even leave your prayer closet or prayer garden or wherever you pray and you will watch your world change. The Lord made it available. Go and get it.